Welcome to Deep Dive, Smart Sustainability's podcast series with more in-depth conversations with our guests on topics we talked about in the Smart Sustainability television show. I'm Nicolette Devidar. Thanks for being with us. Our topic today, UN Challenge Revolutionizing Energy to Make the Planet Sustainable. And my guest is John Rosebush. He's president of Worldwide Development Corporation who says he has an invention that could provide 90% of the globe's energy demands at a fraction of the cost. Let's hear more about this. Let's see how it could possibly work and how perhaps you could support him and find out more information if you're interested in. Uh, my name is John Rosebush, and I'm the CEO and founder of the Worldwide Development Corporation. Yes, exactly. And that's what I want to talk to you about. So, John, your main focus is energy. How did you get into that? Well, uh, right after high school, I joined the military and I was a paratrooper during Vietnam. And uh, when I got out of the military, I went to college and my dad owned a large construction outfit. So I worked construction through college and I really graduated college in three years, which is pretty amazing because I had a couple of children by then. So after college, I went to work for Marathon Oil Company. It's a large international oil company. And uh, I worked, I, I was based in Ohio and I worked there for 26 years. I was a lead analyst and I traveled a lot and, and uh, worked on a lot of different projects for, for the oil business. Well, at the age of 42, I had a massive heart attack and I literally died and I died three different times. I died uh, just getting ready to play basketball and they shocked me three times to bring me back. I died again in the ambulance and I died four days later in the hospital. I was in a coma for 19 days and I was 42 years old and I was an athlete. So it was very unusual. So uh, at the age of 50, I retired from Marathon Oil Company because I had made quite a bit of money and I built houses on the side where I was working there. So we saved up quite a bit. And so here I am at the age of 50, nothing to do. So I just went up, I, we moved back to Michigan where I'm from. And I, I went up to the Traverse City area uh, because it's a resort area. And I start walking around and looking at rivers and I knew we were gonna run out of oil I, uh, from working at the oil company. Uh, not right today, BP predicts we have 50 years of oil remaining. 47 actually is their last predict, prediction. Mm -hmm. And they're not a left wing type thing. They're, they're a major, you know, they're one of the largest oil companies in the world. So when I was walking around the rivers up there, I thought, you know, we're going to run out of oil. So we need energy. So I, I met a few other retired engineers, actually precisely 25 of them that do little projects for different cities, et cetera. And I started talking with one of the main guys, which now he's probably about 75, 76 years old. And we were talking about what types of alternative energy that we're gonna need to produce because we know we can't consume resources to power the planet. We would just run out of them, uh, like corn or soybean or, or sugar cane like they do in Brazil. So we were looking at, okay, wind, it's intermittent and it, it would never be able, we'll never be able to power a planet by the weather. And we looked at solar the same way. So then we start looking around for what type of energy source we can use. And we, we come up with river flow, uh, not dams, but river flow. It's the most dense form of energy on the planet. There's nothing else that compares. It's 24 seven energy. And it makes sense if we could harness that in such a way to generate a lot of energy, that would be the way to go. So for the next 12 years, I worked on it and we failed. We could always produce energy, but it wasn't enough energy to bring it to the world. 12 years of building prototypes, putting them in rivers, taking them out, getting DNR permits, uh, spending lots of my money because I funded it. And we just failed and we gave up. And you know how you work on something for that long and you give up, you can't get it out of your head. So about six months after we gave up, I come up with a brand new concept that we had never tried. And by the way, during that 12 years, we collaborated with the University of Michigan, Northern Michigan University, 25 engineers brainstorming thousands and thousands of hours. So this wasn't, you know, just me looking at it. 
But six months after we quit, I come up with a brand new concept. And it was something totally different than what we ever tried. And so I ran the numbers again, all the engineering and everything. And uh, it was an ex just a large, large amount of energy. Actually, back to the basics, it was foot pounds of torque that I could, I could create. Yeah. Uh, so I said, well, let me look at this. So for the next two years, I continued to work on it. I didn't tell anybody or anything else. And I completely transformed the project maybe three or four times to where it is today. Mm -hmm. And but the main progress happened in the last three years, it sounds. Yes. About three years ago, I'd say approximately. And uh, it, it, it was huge. It was a huge discovery. Uh, so then for the next two years, I, I worked and worked and worked on it. And I, I made it so we could distribute it anywhere. Uh, I, uh, much more efficient. And actually today hang on, we- Hang on, don't give us all the details yet. We got to build up to this a little oh, bit. Okay. So I have more question on that. So my main okay. thing was, how did you get into energy? So the, so the main reason for you to get into energy was mainly because you realized early on that we were running out of oil and that we just couldn't consume all the resources that we had. Right, you, you, you know, right now, with BP predicting 47 years of oil remaining, let, let me give you two examples so you, you, it will help you. Uh, you know, in the United States, they, uh, uh, they talk about a lot about the Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota oil shale fine. Mm -hmm. That's been a big discussion around. Mm -hmm. That is 9 billion barrels. And the world consumes 33 billion barrels a year. That's less than a four-month world oil supply. Yet the United States has bragged about it over and over and over. But uh, that's three-month world oil supply. Uh, over in Europe, as you should be aware of, the North Sea has dried up completely. There's no more oil. They're not even looking for it over there no more. Yep. Uh, the North Pole, that you know, the Arctic, which is uh, the ice is melting, they think they can drill there. The predictions are, and they're, they're estimates by oil companies, that there's 90 billion barrels of oil there. Mm -hmm. So you might say, wow, that's going to last a while. No, less than a three-year world oil supply. And the that whole, would mean that we go in and, and despite all of this would destroy all the landscape, all the ecosystems just for the drilling stuff. Yeah, oceans rising because the North Sea's melting and, 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 you know, the Arctic's melting up there. And then all of a sudden we get only three years of oil. So we'll never be able to drill our way out of this problem. They, they think they found another large discovery in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, another country. I, I, I forget right now. Uh, Australia, uh, and they think it's a uh, maybe a five-year oil supply. Again, five more years. So you so take really forty-seven. What you're saying though is we're we're totally on borrowed time. We're we're further than borrowed time. This is an emergency. Let me explain to you why too. Mm -hmm. If we consume all the oil in the world, let's just say we do that, right? And then we figure figure out a way fifty years from now how to power our planet. Mm -hmm. 30% of the oil consumed in the United States isn't for energy. It's to make products. That's how we make tires, asphalt, shingles. Uh, over 7,000 products in the United States was made from petrochemical stocks, which come from oil. And we need those products. Think about a world without plastics. Actually, I could imagine that a world without plastics would be a very good place to be because we, there is so much plastic everywhere that at this point we even have it in our lungs because we're breathing plastic particles. That, so that might be. I'm concerned. I think a world without plastic would be just fine. Well, a world without plastic could never so support seven to ten billion people. That's predicted by the year 2050. Look around. Look at all the plastics. It's not good in food products. I'll grant you that. But it's if not we didn't, good in packaging either. Look at all the waste we have. We need to recycle that waste. That's part of what I've been trying to preach. If a world we can never support a world, a modern society without plastics. What would we I, make everything out of? Uh, glass, tin, wood? It'd be impossible. Look around at all the packaging, everything that goes on in a modern society. We could not support a modern society without. No, it. but I will say one thing. I think that. Don't forget, we've been had we've been having a society that's totally built on the consumption part. So we've, it's all been focused externally because our economic systems are built on consumption, which means which means it's all externally focused. But that's not the future, and people are realizing that. 
Well, I agree. Well, I don't want to even debate with that, but all I'm saying is that the plastic necessarily, to me, isn't really the big hook. Well, I agree that right now we rate our countries on GDP, okay, which is, and we have a society that is a fossil fuel consumption throwaway society. It's yeah. a society that will not work. Uh, it's not sustainable, and we see that a, as we look at things. But think about a, a society made up of alternative energy, mm -hmm. uh, a recyclable, sustainable society. And so not only am I preaching that we need to get off oil, but we need to be able to recycle all plastics and all oil materials to use them again as plastics and oil materials. Well, so, that goes back to the circular economy. Yes, the 360 economy. So here's what I propose. Not only do we need to install this new energy invention, which I believe will relieve us all of, of all oil for energy, okay? The next thing we need to do is build recycle centers all around the entire planet to recycle those plastics. And we can no longer have single use plastics. Every single plastic that is, is made has to be able to be recycled. That is the only responsible way. Those two things are absolutely necessary to have a sustainable planet. Mm -hmm. and, and without both of them, we cannot. Now, mm -hmm. I agree that plastics and food are possibly causing problems today health-wise. Well, so, not possibly. That's a fact. Well, so that means that we need to be able to, with our food products, come up with alternatives. But plastics and everything else, from computers to you name it in this world, is necessary. And I we need- I agree with you on this one, but I don't want to get stuck on that because I want to move on to you, you know, your, your system. But before we go there, I'd like to get to know more about John. Who's John Rosebush in three adjectives? Uh, he's getting old. Uh, That's not has, an adjective, getting old. <laughs> I know, but but it's true. Uh, he's an average human being uh, <laughs> that worked on something uh, for his children and grandchildren and your children and grandchildren. Uh -huh. uh, money's not his motivation. Uh, his health, he has health issues. And so he don't care to be a billionaire. And he surely don't want to live in a mansion with a bunch of guards out front. He's been very social in his life. He cares a lot, a lot about people. Uh, he likes to travel. Uh, he enjoys learning new things all the time. Uh, uh, he's just a, a regular person and he don't want the wealthy people in the world to benefit from this, even though they will be from cheap energy. He wants the benefits of this to go to the bottom half of the world. Because he thinks that's the only way there could be a healthy world. Yeah. Now you have grandkids, you said, right? So when, you see, when you see your grandkids in the morning when you get up and, and you see them and you think about 2050, you see your grandkids, what are you thinking about? What kind of world are they going to live in? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I have grandkids that range from five. I have a five-year-old grandson, a seven-year-old granddaughter, a nine-year-old granddaughter, a 16 year old grandson and a 19 year old granddaughter. And I love them with everything I am. Uh, that's what happens when you get old. Uh, you start to wonder what world are they gonna live in? What kind of life are they gonna have? Are they gonna have a life that's healthy, that is sustainable? Uh, uh, it, even today, we see so many issues in the world. If, if we could have a two hour session, Nicolette, you and me, just about the issues that is facing this planet that are oh, severe right. and not just social. Um, uh, I could go two hours just on the physical issues that are happening yeah. between yeah. water shortages, energy shortages, air pollution, oceans uh, dying out, glaciers melting, I, uh, uh, North and South Pole melting. I mean, I could go on for two hours just to l label all the issues that our, our world is facing. Then on top of it, one of the worst situations, and the reason why I'm on this social platform is because of the inequities around the world. 10% mm -hmm. uh, of the people own 90% of the wealth. Uh, we have decision makers that should not be decision makers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we need to balance out the world. You know, Bill Gates, he isn't the know-it-all, yet people keep asking me, why don't you go to Bill Gates? And I say, why? 
what is he? He's a computer person. Or why don't you, 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 you know, now Bezos wants to get involved in trying to make all the decisions around the world. It's not a healthy planet like this. Uh, no, it isn't. And actually, it, it isn't. And you say on your website, you actually say men's ultimate responsibility is to create a sustainable planet. Now, as you just talked about a whole range of issues, a sustainable planet has many components. What makes it generally sustainable to you? If you could sum it up in a sentence, what makes it sustainable to you? Or what is sustainability to you? Let, let well, me the, the first thing is, there's two sides to sustainability. Mm -hmm. One is the physical side to it, and the other one's the social side to it. Mm -hmm. And they're both distinctly different, yet they are interconnected deeply. The the physical side to it, there's two things that are absolutely necessary to have a sustainable planet. And that is to uh, be able to power this planet without consuming resources. And that doesn't matter if it's if we're trying to grow the product to do that or if we're using fossil fuels. Uh, either way, it's impossible. Fossil fuels is the worst kind, but, but even trying to grow because we have to feed 7.8 billion people, up to 10 billion people. We don't we don't have the capability to grow for energy, grow food for energy, and feed the planet. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. So that's the physical side to it. The second part of that is recycling, which is exactly what we brought up. Yeah. Uh, you, we uh, right now 30% of the oil consumed in, in on the planet in the United States is to make products, plastics, etc. We can no longer be irresponsible. And, and have a consumption throwaway society. We, uh, 7.8 billion people, there was only a little over 1 billion people in the year 1950. Now there's 7.8. Yeah. Why did that occur? It's huge. Why did that occur? I can tell you why. Petrochemical stocks made plastics, et cetera, which allowed us to, to, uh, to be able to grow and support that many people. The next thing is medicines have improved, which is the longevity of life. So between those two things, we went from 1.5 billion feet people to 7.6, 7.8, projected to be 10 billion people by the year 2050. So if we cannot power our planet and recycle all oil products to preserve that oil for future generations to make products, mm -hmm. it's, oil is very valuable to make products. Those two things are the physical things that are necessary to create a sustainable planet. Everything else including desalination of water, et cetera, make a healthy planet. But the two things that are absolute are recycling and powering the planet. That's, so the, that's the physical you. side to it. Yeah. So let, so me ask you, let me ask you, energy, obviously, as you talked about, is the key to sustainability. Yet, to date, all that you just mentioned is still fairly widely ignored i mean the fact that we need more recycling the fact that we need to be more conscious why is it still so much ignored when the writing has been on the wall for decades because the world is run by greed nicolette uh it's total greed so it's very easy to just make something sell it and throw it throw your hands up and say i'm done then i've made my money and that's where they make the money uh, to to be responsible, you need to be able to recycle that so you can make more products. But that's costly, and right now, it, it, uh, the profits in that are are not that high. So people, the world just ignores it because they're after nothing but the dollar, and and we know that greed runs everything. Ten percent of the people uh, own ninety percent of the wealth in every country around the world. I know. So so this is not you know the United States used to be the middle class. It's no different than the third world country today. And China and India and Russia, 10% of the people own 90% of the wealth. Yep. So what is the common theme? They're all different types of governments, et cetera. It's greed. And that's what the world has run on today. Nothing but greed and power. And until we fix that, nothing else we, we can do will, will help us through this large transition or the great reset as a lot of people call it will happen. So yeah. now that's a great lead in to talk. Well, about well I'm not done yet. Let, let, let me, let me talk about the, the social side to a okay. sustainable planet. We have to be able to create hope and a chance for prosperity for everybody in the world, everybody. Otherwise it's not going to work. 
uh, if, if I gave this new energy invention to the world and they decided to be, build recycle centers and we solve the phys physical problems with sustainability, but yet 10% of the people remain the, well, the, the top 10% of the ownership in the world uh, belong to 10% of the people, it's still not sustainable. You, you, you got two sides to it. And the social side is just as important as the physical side. So, so we have to fix both those issues in order to make sustainability. And you concentrate much more on the social side and uh, I concentrate on the physical side, but I realize that your side that you're concentrating on is just as important as what, what, what I've been concentrating on. No, and actually we focus on all of this because they all come out to it, but it's holistically, it, it all, you know, it, it, it comes together. I do think, that the individual person though bears a big part of responsibility because at the end of it it really starts within it starts with understanding responsibility it starts with understanding stewardship it starts with understanding nature and be connected with nature and not just see it as a throwaway exploiting thing that you can use i i think this is one of the 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 real big problems that we're so disconnected from ourselves and from nature because that's why we don't understand many of those things and then there's also no concept of responsibility when you go out and you see people throw plastic bottles in the nicest areas and you really have to ask yourself what's going on in a brain of someone like that who can't think about picking up their own trash right well, well one of the things is that that you know because i have concentrated on the physical side we don't have the tools right now to solve the physical problems, except for what I've done. Uh, this new energy invention fixes something that is missing out there. Uh, the, the recycling uh, is just the, the will of the people, but the, the energy generation has been missing. And because uh, wind and solar will not uh, be able to power this planet in the future. We, we cannot power the planet by the weather. Let's talk about your energy thing, because I found this really interesting. So it, you say, your invention, and I don't know if I should, we should call it a system or an invention, or what should we call it? <coughs> Is it a system? Uh, invention. Uh, it's okay. definitely an invention. It, it, it's okay. a, uh, you, you know, it's not a system of, you know, we change this process or something like that. Okay. It, it's so a brand invention. new invention. We'll call it an invention. So you say your invention is capable of powering 90% of the planet without any human intervention, unless there's an emergency. So right. specify, please, what do you mean? Let's start with this. What do you mean by no human intervention? Okay, well, this new energy invention first has the capability to power the planet 15,000 times over, okay? So we have the ability- so Wait a minute, to, 15 times thousand more than we need or 15 times thousand more than we currently use? 15,000 times more than what we produce, generate today. So okay. we could, if we, created the same amount of energy that we produce today, we could generate that 15,000 times that. 15,000 Earths today, we could, we could pop. for people to consume more crap? Well, no. Uh, again, that the reason why I put that out there was to show the capabilities of it. We okay. would never do that. Uh, but it, it, because of the extreme capabilities, I thought it was important for people to understand how powerful this new energy invention is. Mm -hmm. uh, in reality, we'll probably end up be producing about 20 terawatts. Today, we produce about seven. So, and the reason why I say that is, well, this will power our transportation fuels. Th this will power our large boilers in big cities for heated water through being able to produce hydrogen. Uh, just a, a lot of, uh, for steel production, hydrogen burns hotter than natural gas or coal. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but we figure about 20 terawatts of electricity to create ample power. The reason why I say 90 or 95%, and you say, well, that seems to be confusing with what he just said, was because there'll be isolated places around the world where this unit, uh, we, we uh, the size of this unit will not be needed. So in other words, if you go up to uh, say Nome, Alaska or something like that, okay? Where there's only a few hundred people or a thousand people. Well, these units are, are by scale. And so the smallest unit is about a 250 megawatt unit. And the large, the, the most common we believe will be a one gigawatt. 
Well, we would only need about 20 megawatts of energy to power gnome, if that, maybe 10. So it doesn't make sense to install one of these up there. So what we will probably do is move that wind, those wind turbines up there so they could generate energy up there because of the small population and the small need for one of these units. So really it's, it's not 90% of the population, it's 90% of the area of okay. the world. Let, let's, okay, before we go a little bit more into the grid, let, let's get a couple of things out of the way so, so listeners can understand what we're talking about. Okay. So we have, so obviously you, you just clarified it's really powerful. It could power, a, you know, the majority of the planet. It says it's unlimited 24 seven. And I let you talk about it. I just want to summarize it. And it, you said it's 2000% cheaper than wind and solar. Yeah, for 5% of the cost of wind and solar. Right. Uh, you're talking about the United Nations challenge out there. And uh, I'll quickly go through the reason why that's out there. About a year and a half ago, I was invited to the Department of Energy in the United States in Washington, DC. I traveled there, I, I met with them. The only thing they were interested in was stealing this new energy invention idea. And so we, we talked and talked and they offered me use of all their laboratories around the country. They were very pleasant to me, but really what they were after was how does this new energy invention work? And they were interested in it to steal. Okay, wait a minute. When you say what they were after, who is they? Department of Energy. Okay. Uh, in Washington, D.C., I met with a, the top hydro. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. So we, 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 we're all listening in because it's complicated for people who have never listened to you before. Right. So you have this invention. We talked a little bit about what it does. Let's stay with the invention for a second. For, for listeners, so they have an idea when we talk about this energy in, invention, give us the ballpark of how we how we envision that is it a, la a large plant is it a large facility is it is it what, what is it and, and it uses water mainly well it's kinetic energy which is based on water movement and uh each unit that we've designed that we think will be the most common is a one gigawatt unit so let me go through the energy definition so people understand mm -hmm. uh, the united states produces about one terawatt of electricity so does china and then it goes pretty far downhill from after that. I think Germany is only, you know, uh, a tenth of that, a little over a tenth of that, okay? So uh, United States, one terawatt of electricity. So one terawatt equals a thousand gigawatts, okay? And Germany uses about 125 gigawatts, just so you know that. So, but a thousand units equal a terawatt. A thousand megawatts equal one gigawatt. And a thousand kilowatts equal one one megawatt. So what we have is uh, our average household uses about 12 kilowatts. So you kind of get the reference. The average size nuclear plant produces about two gigawatts of electricity. So that's kind of the definition as we're talking about this. So our, our, our cheapest, uh, because uh, this new energy invention, the larger it gets, the cheaper the energy is. Okay. So it, 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 it's a, uh, 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 it's by scale there. So uh, to a 250 megawatt unit costs more money per per energy generation than a one gigawatt does. So one gigawatt is the largest that we've designed. Uh, it's the most efficient and, and the cheapest energy that it can be produced. And how do people envision that? Do they envision that as a as a building, as a plant, as a, how do we envision that? It's about the size of a football field and it, and, and it, it uh, it, it operates off like a lazy river. So imagine a football field, and now you can imagine what a one gigawatt unit looks like. And two gigawatts is the average size nuclear plant. So uh, the size of two football fields will equal one gigawatt. And it's not a plant. Um, uh, it, it, it will be totally covered. But the only reason it's totally covered is so the weather cannot affect the operation. Uh, it uses like a lazy river off from it. And we don't want, you know, dirt and everything else within the the operation. So we completely cover it again, the size of a football field. Mm -hmm. So so you know, imagine a whole bunch of football fields all over the planet. Okay. Now, if we overlap those units, because because each each installation has two power units to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So each one is capable of generating a half a gigawatt of electricity. So combined, it's one gigawatt per installation. So if we overlap them around the world, 
uh, they have backup built right in because of the two power units, and then they'll have backup with the overlapping of it. We also have the capability to match up supply and demand, okay? Because there's peak loads in areas which people don't understand, but you know, when everybody's using a lot of electricity, when nobody is. Uh, so we have the ability to match up the demand with the power unit operations. And what that does is it allows us to completely manage the utility grids around the world, along with the power generation, mm -hmm. which says then we can power the entire planet, at least where these grids are in installed, which should be everywhere because it's such cheap energy, 5% of the cost of wind and solar. So that means there's no humans that's needed unless there's an emergency. So when I talk about being able to power the entire planet, I mean, we can, the whole planet could be powered unless there's like a generator that goes out, our electricity grid that goes out, our, our transformer, major transformer blows out. Because if, if the demand goes down, we can reduce the supply automatically without any human intervention. So we imagine a world where nobody does anything unless there's some type of emergency no, and we power everything. How huh? you, let me ask you something. How do you think an invention like this will go down with, the money makers in that game? Uh, not very good, but the, but that's because they're short-sighted. Uh, I'll explain to you why. If we're going to truly create a healthy planet, a healthy, sustainable planet, the opportunities with cheap energy way outweigh the cost of maintaining electricity grids and oil production and the oil workers. If we install recycle centers everywhere around the planet, imagine that much effort. Imagine the effort of installing these units and updating the electricity grids. Imagine the concept of taking all our vehicles on land transportation and converting them to run off hydrogen. Uh, imagine uh, uh, building desalination plants all around the world. And the reason why we don't desalinate today is because of lack of energy. And, and now building one of these units close to the desalination plants and producing all the fresh water you want very cheap and then dispersing that around the world to turn the world into a water oasis. Uh, I'll give you one example, the Aero Sea in, in uh, Africa. One of the largest fresh body of water in the world is dried up and there's 10 or 12 other bodies of water, very similar. You know about the Rhine River in, uh, uh, in Germany, drying up. Yeah. So imagine de desalination plants and, and powering a pipeline and refilling the RLC along with the 10 or 12 other fresh bodies of water. Imagine if the Rhine River running low to desalinate water in, uh, uh, in, in the ocean nearby there and, and making sure the river flows there. Imagine the glaciers in Europe having problems melting and causing the rivers to start to dry up. Imagine being able to refreeze those, those glaciers up there. And the same with the North and South Pole. You know, if we don't, maybe maybe we'll never have to. But if we do in the future, this new this this new energy invention could do that because we can install one of these units in the North and South Pole the same as anywhere else. So we have capabilities that we would never have to solve major major issues. Actually, world sustainable issues for the entire planet, and that's what's so. Uh, uh, that's what's so important about this is those capabilities that I explained. We'll, we'll probably never even use close to that, but whatever humanity needs going forward, this could produce enough energy to do that. And so I actually think of not just sustainability of the human race, the survival of the human race may be subject to this new energy invention. But I, I'm going to challenge you on something here because I think there is, a danger with that as well that we need to talk about. So for example, if you have such a powerful invention that you could even use the energy to refreeze the glaciers, as you just put it, I see a real huge problem with that because that could easily be misused to have more human intervention in, in the ecosystems of the world than otherwise. And I, at this point don't trust enough in humans because many are not quite at that point yet where 
they really would be led more from the heart versus from greed and other things. So there is a danger in that. Would we even want that? Well, let me just say this. Right now, there is glaciers, right? And and in our oceans haven't risen so bad that we lost all our coastal lines, right? Yeah, but there's also because there's there there are other shifts in there. I mean, we do know that that that, that the poles are shifting, and I think there's also a larger concept to it that naturally needs to happen. So that doesn't mean that it's all up for humans to stop the process. I don't think that's our role at all. Well, uh, right now the scientists say that a lot of this is happening because of what we've done. Yeah, but the, the scientists carbon, only see it externally. Many of them do not see the spiritual dimension that's with it, thus cannot see the whole picture. I'm not saying that the use of this could not be used irresponsibly. Nicola. Okay. I'm just saying, we can see what I'm getting with, so we got to think about if something I understand. is powerful, there's got to be some sort of a, a lever to not let people go nuts with it. That's my point. Well, let me say this. <laughs> I, I've been concerned about things much less important as what you're talking about, as far as the irresponsibility of this. Mm -hmm. This new energy invention will give every country on the planet independence uh total independence and we have we have countries in this world that are very irresponsible which you're well aware of and once they have energy independence uh is that going to cause major issues i'll give you an example north korea if, if they're energy independent which is wealth which is wealth by the way and even african nations and south american nations the third world countries that are ruled by by you know force and and everything else. Uh, uh, Russia, for an example, uh, not as bad, but but still, uh, what are they going to do with energy independence? Uh, how are the world's going to react? Uh, is the United Nations going to have the United Nations need to have more power, not less power, to make these things work? In other words, they need to kind of enforce recycling, not enforce, but promote it dramatically. They need to step up with positive things for the world. Right now, they're just they just talk about things. Because the other thing I did, besides going to the Department of Energy, I was invited to the United Nations. And okay? that brings us to the UN challenge, right? That we can yes. Do. And I went to the United Nations, and I gave a small speech to just a, a small group of people. And all I heard was politics. So when I left there, between that and the Department of Energy in the United States, I thought, what the heck? Uh, and all they were interested in was stealing the invention. So when I got back home, I thought, how am I going to introduce this? And so I decided to go to social media. Now, you know, when a person just starts out on social media, he has no idea what he's doing. So for the first year, I was just a bumbling idiot out there and all the skepticism and everything else. So after about a year of listening to all this stuff, I said, well, let me come up with a UN challenge because I'm not asking for money from anybody. I've never asked anybody for a penny during this entire 15 year endeavor. Not one penny. I've never borrowed any money for, for it. I funded the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, how do I get past all this skepticism? Well, I'll just create a challenge. A UN challenge, I'll send it to the United Nations and uh, it, it will be ridiculous, but, but I'll stand behind it. And that way I get the attention. And I don't have to answer all the skepticism about the capabilities of this new energy invention. So what was the challenge? And I thought, well, that will work. You know, that's got to work. Uh, if you read the challenge, 99.9% .9 of the scientists in the world think it's impossible. And I don't ask for a penny. So I'm not trying to make any money on it. Okay. So what I'm trying to do is make sure those benefits go to the bottom half of the world. I, uh, I can't have the top 10% of the people exploiting this like they have everything else. We need a fair and balanced world. And that's part of that social thing. So finally, about six months ago, I've been uh, contacted by a lot of people and people are starting to pay attention. And the reason being is we're having so many issues in the world. They're starting to say, well, maybe this man is, you know, is, is telling the truth. He's not asking for money. I even had the United Nations Secretary General just friend me on Facebook about two weeks ago. And I thought, why didn't you send me a, a nice letter and, and invite me to the United Nations and so we can get on with this challenge. And uh, uh, so far, nothing, but he's friended me on Facebook. I, I'm, I'm just bewildered by, by his contact with me. And he sent me messages. He hadn't just friended me. And I, and I thought, well, 
you know, let's let's get on with the challenge. Let's make this real. Uh, I'm willing to go to the United Nations tomorrow. I have all the materials. I have uh, all the engineering, 3D drawings, everything, Nicolette. Every. So you did all the testing at home, so it's more than just on paper. You've tested it, right? Oh yeah, I've got a, a, a prototype about the size of a of a truck uh, that was it was built in ten different fabrication shops and then put, assembled by me. That way, nobody knows how uh, what this prototype looks like. I, I've uh, protected this thing with my life. Uh, I, I, all the uh, computer equipment that was used to uh, engineer this and everything else has never been hooked up to the internet. So I, it's not like I can say, God, did somebody hack this? It's never been hooked up. Hmm. It's all hidden. Uh, the engineering's all done. Uh, all, everything's done. Uh, even 3D printed materials to show we're not, even 3D printed materials is part of it to show we're not some backdoor, uh, you know, garage type person promoting this. This is all professionally done. So you've tested it, you've got material, your intent for the challenges to get invited and present it? Right. And, and within, within the same day, within a, two or three hours, the, they, 99 out of 100 engineers will, will say the capabilities are correct, uh, it, it, that I can produce that much energy. And within a week or so, 99 of 100 engineers will say the cost is okay. You know, it takes a little time to, to make sure they cover all the aspects to making sure my cost estimates are correct, but it will be done. So, uh, and I'm willing to go in front of the United Nations on the stage and show them this new energy invention. And if I can't pass that challenge, that seems impossible to 99 out of 100 scientists, I will give up the rights to the new energy invention and close down the company. That's how, uh, that's how confident I am in the capabilities in this new energy invention. I'm 100% confident, not 99, 100% confident in, in, in the United Nations challenge. And without asking for money, and also even stating where 99% of the profits will go to help poor people rebuild a middle class and operate the, uh, the Worldwide Development yeah, Corporation. Work, there's not gonna be any profits. Right. And, but if it, uh, we can do that right after the partnership has been formed, that will be the very first thing that happens. And if I can't pass that challenge, then I throw my hands up and walk away. Okay, and that's so it. Let's talk about what stands in the way at this point. What, what, what is sort of an obstacle that stands in the way? Would you, what would you need? Well, all I need is the United Nations are a few large countries that can protect the patent. We have not submitted the patents because anymore the patent system is so corrupt and it's just reverse engineering. In other words, I submit patents, right? And then GE comes along and they submit patents that are 99% the same as mine, but have a 1% difference. Now I have to fight them in court, really? Uh, that's impossible. So then they just go on about their business and, and say, forget it. You, you know, this guy can't can't stop us. And then there would be another hundred companies just like that. So then what happens is now these wealthier country companies and countries just take this invention and run with it without any responsibility to the sustainability, to the health of the world, to the bottom half of the world, and, and just move on. And so then it, I can't allow that to happen. I would rather the invention get buried with me in a, in a grave and, uh, and then to give it to these wealthy people. They've shown what they will do. They'll exploit it, they'll corrupt it, they'll cheat everybody out of everything. And poor people and middle, middle class people will continue on a path there, which is downward. And we'll, I will just give them another tool in their toolbox to continue to exploit people around the world. I'm not gonna allow that to happen. Why, why do you think has no one else come up with that yet? You know, my son asked me that. That's very funny that you asked me that. Uh, we decided that most of the scientists and engineers around the world, all these uh, think tanks, et cetera, are usually run by one or two people. And those one or two people are the leaders of it. So everybody that works underneath them have to filter their ideas through those two people. And engineers and scientists are not very good at coming up with, with things that, you know out of the box. The last power generation capabilities were the nuclear, and that was done in the 1950s. If you talk to an engineer about a solution, they'll relate it to some theory they learn in school, and they'll, they'll have their own ideas 
and they'll be closed to, to anything that is out of the box. Uh, I've seen that with so many engineers that I've worked with. My son is 47 and an engineer, and he has got the same ideas, not about this invention, but in, in general, if you talk to him about something, boom, he relates to some theory, learn in school, some, and, and, and don't go any further on it. And I think that's what's happened in the world is that, that the, uh, the, they're locked into, uh, you know, and the other thing they do is, is they go get money to do research. So they're not open to different ideas and stuff. 12 years of wearing out two pair of waders and rivers and being very smart about construction, et cetera, and working with 25 engineers, you come up with a lot of different ideas. And, and, uh, and, and, and then for me to continue, and, and, and the other thing that I had practice with, I worked in IT for Marathon Oil Company, and I was known as the person that come with, with out-of-the-box ideas that we actually you know, implemented. So I was very well known for thinking outside the box before I even started this. And then with my construction background and with wearing out two pair of waders, I think I was fortunate enough to come up with this idea and pursue it and for it to be uh, where it is today. Because today, again, I, who in the world would never ask for a penny and create a United Nations challenge, which you're willing to go to the United Nations and meet with strangers. And if they don't agree with your 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 uh, calculations and with your new energy invention, throw your hands up and walk away. I mean, that should say everything about everything. Uh, th there should be no question about my sincerity, about my motives. Oh, I don't uh, think anyone would question that. I think it's just more that people have to get used to this. And well, then you have to you, you have to say that I'm not very intelligent then. And and that's okay that uh, uh, I will take that uh, criticism, but let's see then. You know, if you're gonna, uh, criticize what I've done are, are the invention. Now, I'm just saying if you're a person and, and you're saying, well, that's impossible, uh, I'm willing to, to put up or shut up, right? I mean, now, I mean that's what this you, is all about. When, when did you send the challenge to the UN? About a year ago. And, Have uh, you heard anything back yet? Yeah, first I heard yeah uh, uh, that their charter doesn't allow them to partner with me, which is a bunch of crap. Uh, and a few other things, but but two weeks ago, uh, the, the Secretary General has a friend of me on Facebook. I see that as a good sign. I also I sent- there is movement? I think there's at least talk. And, and I also sent the President of the United States, which I can't count on, but I, I have, uh, cause I'm not, uh, you, you know, I, I'm not political whatsoever. This is about poor people and middle-class people around the world and, and inequities, et cetera. But I have sent him that, and we'll see how he responds. Now, he, he I sent that two weeks ago, and he hadn't got a response yet. And I oh, know he's busy you with... It, you sent it to President Biden. Yeah. And, and now I know he's busy with a lot of stuff going on, but he hasn't responded, which is a good sign, that because they always respond, especially to a professional letter written like that. So I'm sure that I'll get back a response, and hopefully that somebody reviewed this, actually paid attention to it. To, to the letter that was sent. And maybe I'll get a positive response there because because he could help me bring in the other partners I need around the world. Because I don't look at uh, the United States as a wherewithal. And let me tell you, they're only 4% of the population on the planet. Even yeah. though they think they're the center of the planet, they're 4% of the population. I need the entire planet to engage in this. But the United States could lead if they wanted to, which would be a very good thing. So very interesting, keep us posted and keep us in tune, so to speak, so we know what's going on. We can probably follow the development on your Facebook page, right? Um, well, more than likely, I, I don't use Facebook that much. My website and LinkedIn is where I really, really concentrate. I do post things on Facebook, but but I have not really uh, uh, used Facebook as a primary driver. So LinkedIn it, is more like where would people where people would get some updates. Yes, but let me say this uh, before we do go. Uh, the website is www.wdcpower.com. And one thing people can do for me, which, you know, I, I, when I say I turn to social media, I have 12,000 followers on LinkedIn. They're all engineers and experts and leaders around the world. I got 50 emails from people like the Prince of Dubai, Prince of Saudi Arabia, uh, venture capital groups around the world, engineers, all the, the the technical and, and top leaders around the world I'm connected with, but I've never tried to connect with the regular people. 
and and right now between you and there's about four or five other outlets that I'll be on, I'm trying to connect with regular people to let them know what's going on. So the best thing that your followers could do for me is to go out to the internet and and see these different posts and share them and uh, like them and uh, share them all, all over, write letters to people and let their friends know of, of what is out here and, and why it's being held up. It's just because I believe the leaders of the world are afraid of change. And oh, yet yeah, this, I think that's a given. And this change is so positive for not only the physical side to it, but it allows regular people to now have the ability to have hope, prosperity, wealth. Imagine all you young people that are listening to this and, and, and older people, 25 cent a gallon equivalent to a gallon of gasoline and the transportation that that would allow for you. And truthfully, uh, if you're 30 years old, it allows you to have kids and have confidence that they're going to have a healthy planet. Now, I'm not selling anything. I'm not asking any of you for any money. I never have. But I am asking you to share this, to like this, to let other people know so we can put pressure on the leaders around the world and the United Nations and, and your governments to uh, step forward and ask, why are you not at least allowing this gentleman to have a chance? The idea of what I need is some, a few lawyers' time to draw a, a partnership together so I can protect these patents for, you, for everybody on this planet. And, 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 that's, people, and I think people understand now more and more that, as I said, everybody has an individual responsibility and that starts with engaging, it starts with supporting new ideas, it starts with being open to new ideas, it starts with being curious about new ideas and new approaches that really push mental boundaries. We're out of time. Thank you so much, John, for joining us. And we'll follow up when there is still a television broadcast to come so we can share more details right on that one. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. I've enjoyed this very much. Thank you.